So, uh, here we go. Very first day we talked about atoms, molecules, and compounds. Really the only important thing from this is the very last part where we talked about uh, polarity and we said that the reason why water is so polar is because oxygen has a really high electronegativity and hydrogen has a really low electronegativity, which means that the oxygen steals away all the electrons from the carbon, or sorry, from the hydrogen, and that means that the hydrogen becomes partially positive and the oxygen becomes partially negative. This leads to all the unique properties of water, which are adhesion, cohesion, um, the fact that water is a really good uh, uh, solvent, um, also the fact that water has a high specific heat and a high, high vaporization, and then the fact that um, ice is less dense than water. Those are all really important unique factors of water that are caused by the fact that it has hydrogen bonding, which is caused by its polarity, okay? We went on to talk about uh, organic compounds then. So that organic compounds uh, get divided into two groups, polymers and monomers, right? And the polymers are when you have a whole bunch of different things uh, bonded together, and the monomers are the different things that get bonded together. If you want to bond monomers together, you need to do a dehydration reaction. A dehydration reaction is gonna have an H and an OH group, and they are going to bond together and release a water, right? That's why it's called dehydration. And then that's gonna make a polymer. If you wanna go in reverse, you're gonna need a water, and that's called a hydrolysis reaction, and will result in a polymer going into two monomers. Okay. Well, then we talked about carbohydrates. We said carbohydrates were all about carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So if they ask you a question about a nitrogen deficiency or a phosphorus deficiency, it is not likely to affect carbohydrates because there's no nitrogen or phosphorus in a carbohydrate. It's only carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Okay. The monosaccharides that we talked about the most were these ones that are hexoses. That means that they have six carbons, but we also talked a little bit about pentoses as far as in um, DNA and RNA. These are the hexoses that are common, glucose, fructose, and galactose. Uh, and then uh, if you have two monomers, two monosaccharides that get bonded together, that's a disaccharide. And then many monosaccharides bonded together is a polysaccharide. The important polysaccharides that we looked at were amylose, which is starch, which is how plants store energy, and glycogen, which is how animals store energy. We know that uh, glycogen is stored in the liver, and we know that, um, that insulin is gonna trigger your body to produce glycogen whenever you have high blood sugar. Cellulose um, is a storage, or sorry, a structural molecule in plants. We know that cellulose gets lignified to become rigid. Uh, chitin is the uh, uh, structural molecule for uh, the exoskeleton of insects and also for the cell wall of fungi. And then peptidoglycan is found in the cell walls of uh, bacteria and prevents them from bursting from water pressure. When we talked about lipids, we said the really most important thing to know about lipids is that they're hydrophobic. Uh, they are made out of mostly carbon and hydrogen. Uh, and if we had to put a monomer on a lipid, we would say that it's the fatty acid tail, but they don't technically have uh, uh, monomers. Okay, so here are fats, and these fats have two different types of tails. These are saturated tails, which means that they are going to um, all go in a straight line here because there's no double bonds to kink them up. This allows them to pack really tightly into an area, which means that they're gonna be solid at room temperature because they're very dense. Uh, and this is an unsaturated fat that is not as dense because there's all these different kinks in the tails, and that means that they'll be liquid at room temperature, okay? This applies to all the different types of um, lipids in that you could have a fossil lipid with different uh, uh, kinky kinks in the tails. Uh, and so if you have no kinks in the tails, that would be a really uh, uh, rigid uh, plasma membrane and that would be bad, right? And then if you have too many kinks, that's a really fluid plasma membrane. And then um, this is like the uh, perfect medium where you have some that are kinked and some that aren't kinked. And so you'll have the right amount of fluidity in the plasma membrane. Then we went on to talk about proteins. We said proteins are all uh, made of, of these 20 amino acids, right? And um, these are these three-dimensional organic molecules that act as like the machinery of the cell. And the 20 different amino acids are um, all variations of this structure. So there's an amine group, a carboxylic acid group, and then an R group. So there's 20 different R groups, and those 20 different R groups are going to lead to the different properties of the amino acids. Some of them are hydrophobic, some of them are hydrophilic, uh, and that is going to cause the different shapes of the proteins. So when a protein gets made, uh, it has a primary structure that is the sequence of amino acids. It has a secondary structure that's caused by the um, hydrogen bonding between the adjacent amino acids and it's going to result in either a beta pleated sheet or an alpha helix and it's got a tertiary structure that's the actual folding of the protein. The folding of the protein is caused by hydrophobic hydrophilic interactions so if you have a large chain of amino acids that are all hydrophobic those ones are going to group towards the center of the molecule the center of the protein and then the hydrophilic ones will wrap around it which gives it its final shape. Once that thing has its final shape that is its it's, uh, it's called a, a, a polypeptide at that point, and the polypeptides can join together 
to form this thing called a quaternary structure, which is multiple polypeptides that are all bonded together. Not all proteins are going to have a quaternary structure, but some of them do. This is hemoglobin here. Later in the year, we talked about um, the fact that sickle cell anemia is caused by misshaped hemoglobin. It's caused by uh, a mutation in the beta chains here. And so these two things change, and it changes the total shape of the hemoglobin, which then changes the shape of the red blood cell. Okay. We want to talk about nucleic acids. There's two types of nucleic acids, uh, DNA and RNA, and they differ based on the sugar that they have. DNA has deoxyribose and sh um, uh, RNA has ribose, uh, and they are pretty much all going to look relatively the same. They've got a phosphate group that's bonded to a pentose. That's a five-carbon sugar. That's the ribose of the deoxyribose, and they all have a nitrogenous base. The nitrogenous base is the A, C, G, T, and U. That's where they get their differences from. Okay. Um, they're going to bond together in a sugar phosphate backbone like this, and all the nucleotides are going to point towards the center. The nucleotides are going to hydrogen bond together like this in order to form the double helix. Okay? Uh, we said that there's this thing called Chargras principle that says that um, the amount of guanine is equal to the amount of cytosine and the amount of adenine is equal to the thymine. So if you know any of these, you can figure out all the rest because these will be, uh, you know, this is the same as this, and then this is the remaining one divided by two. Okay? Um, RNA, different types of RNA. Here are the different types of RNA. So this is DNA, right? And the DNA is going to separate and um, it's going to get made into this stuff, which is mRNA, right? So the mRNA is the complementary uh, strand here and this mRNA can then travel out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm. Right, and once it gets into the cytoplasm, it's going to meet up with one of these guys. This is a ribosome, right, and it's going to match up with the ribosome like this, so that the uh, oh geez, so that the uh, codon is facing out of this thing, which is the A site, and it's going to meet up with this thing. That's tRNA. On the tRNA, you've got an amino acid, and then down here, you've got an anticodon, and that anticodon should match up perfectly with one of the codons in this D or this mRNA, like this. Right? Right? And then that allows it to uh, put the amino acids into the correct order. Making the mRNA from the DNA is called transcription. Making the protein from the mRNA is called translation. Right? This is tRNA. This is rRNA, this ribosome here. And this is mRNA. Right? Thermodynamic stuff. So the laws of thermodynamics are important. The first law of thermodynamics says in any energy or any chemical or physical process, you cannot create or destroy energy. Okay? That's kind of one that everybody knows. The second law of thermodynamics is the one that says anytime you transfer energy, some of the usable energy gets lost as heat, right? Which means that in ecology is what translates to the fact that energy can't uh, cycle through an ecosystem. Energy has to flow through it because every time energy is transferred, some of the usable energy is lost as heat. This is the Gibbs free energy equation. What you need to know about the Gibbs free energy equation is that it is on the formula sheet. So if you get asked a question about Gibbs free energy, you flip back to the formula sheet and do the question, right? Okay, that was unit one. Unit two, the smallest things. So we started out talking about how we observe these smallest things. If we want to look on the inside of a relatively small thing, but not a super small thing, we can use a light microscope. Um, if we want to look on the surface of something that's extremely small or we want to have very fine detail on the surface of something, we can use a scanning electron microscope. And if we want to look on the inside of something that's very small, we'll use a transmission electron microscope. Okay? Um, we said that cell size is limited by the surface area to volume ratio and that as cells become larger, they have less surface area per volume and that's going to make them less efficient at diffusion and stuff like that. Um, this can be fixed by having long cells. Uh, that have that are very skinny. So we said that the spirilla ha being very long and very skinny is going to have the largest surface area per volume. Um, then we talked about uh, how eukaryotes came to be. And so eukaryotes have membrane-bound organelles, and there's two types of membrane-bound organelles in eukaryotes. There's the ones that are the uh, endomembrane system that can share their membranes, and then there's the ones that are not part of the endomembrane system. The ones that are part of the endomembrane system that can share their, their uh, um, 
plasma membrane are um, the result of this thing called the um, infolding theory or the invagination theory. And so what this says is that there were little pinches off of the, um, the outer plasma membrane that resulted in these organelles that were left in the cell then. Uh, and then the endosymbiotic theory says that there was a prokaryote and a large prokaryote and the large prokaryote ate the small one and then the small one was so useful that it just didn't digest it, it kept it inside and it was able to reproduce together, okay? The endosymbiotic theory is what gave us all of the power producing organelles, right? Like the mitochondria and the chloroplast, right? Uh, and then the uh, infolding theory is what gave us all the ones of the endomembrane uh, system. The big part about the endomembrane system is that um, one organelle can secrete a vesicle and then that vesicle can meet up with another organelle and fuse with it. And that's fine because they all share the exact same um, plasma membrane. We said that ribosomes are the organelles that are shared between prokaryotes and eukaryotes because they're non-membrane bound. And so um, they're used for making proteins in both prokaryotes and eukaryotes. We know that in uh, eukaryotes, there's two types of ribosomes. Free ribosomes are the ones that are floating around and will make proteins that are gonna be used inside the cell. And bound ribosomes are the ones that are bound to the rough ER and will make proteins that are for export from the cell, okay? Um, important parts of the power producing organelles. This is a mitochondria. It's got an outer membrane and an inner membrane, okay? And then the inner membrane gets folded up here and they call the folds of the inner membrane the cristae of the mitochondria. Then inside the inner membrane is called the mitochondrial matrix and the area between the inner membrane and the outer membrane is called the intermembrane space. This is important because during uh, the electron transport chain, H plus ions are pumped into the intermembrane space, intermembrane space, and then flow back into the mitochondrial matrix through ATP synthase, okay? Um, glycolysis takes place out of the mitochondria and then um, the uh, Krebs cycle occurs in the mitochondrial matrix and the uh, electron transport chain is embedded into the cristae. Very similar uh, in the chloroplast here. The chloroplast has these things called thylakoids that are little discs and H plus ions get pumped into the thylakoid space and then they diffuse back out into this area that's called the stroma. Stuff about the plasma membrane here. Um, here is a, a sample plasma membrane. This plasma membrane has phospholipids on here. That's the main component of the plasma membrane. It's also got cholesterol in there. We said the cholesterol is gonna be the thing that um, is uh, going to regulate the fluidity of the membrane, right? Um, makes it so that it doesn't get too fluid or too solid. We said that proteins are really important for transport and also for recognition, for cell to cell recognition. Um, this is a channel protein that's gonna allow things to flow through it. This is a peripheral protein. This one would be called transmembrane because it goes all the way through the protein or all the way through the uh, membrane and this one is peripheral because it doesn't go all the way through. Um, the carbohydrates are for cell to cell recognition uh, and so these are glycolipids and these are glycoproteins. Glycolipids are attached to lipids, glycoproteins are attached to proteins and these will all um, interface with a receptor protein on other cell that allows the cells to communicate, okay? Uh, we said that because the plasma membrane is made out of a phospholipid bilayer, that means that only small nonpolar things like oxygen and carbon dioxide are able to diffuse in and out of it freely. This process is called simple diffusion. Something like H plus ions that uh, is, has a charge can't diffuse freely through the phospholipid bilayer, so that means that it has to go through a special transport protein. Specifically, this could be ATP synthase here. And then water is uh, also very polar, so it can't go through, so it has to rely on a special type of uh, protein called an aquaporin, okay? Uh, the process of water diffusing is called osmosis. This is called facilitated diffusion, where it goes through a protein, and this is simple diffusion, okay? These are all types of passive transport. Passive transport requires no energy. That's in contrast to active transport that does require energy. And uh, the type of active transport that we use the most or we talked about the most was the sodium potassium pump. We said that in the sodium potassium pump, um, we are gonna pump sodium ions out of the neuron and potassium ions into the neuron to make the neuron a salty banana, right? This is pumping them against their concentration gradient in order to create an electrochemical gradient. Um, then we talked about photosynthesis. So in photosynthesis, um, the light reactions are the part that's going to make ATP or NADPH, right? And so the way that it works is you get an electron that's down here in photosystem two. It gets excited by um, oxygen, or not by oxygen, by uh, light, and splits this water, and the water splits into H plus ions here and then uh, donates electrons 
to photosystem two. Those electrons travel through, power this H plus ion pump to move more H plus ions into the th uh, into the yeah the thylakoid space, uh, and then uh, gets powered back up by photosystem one here. Gets transferred over into NADP reductase, uh, and then makes NADPH. Okay, this is called non-cyclic flow, and it makes both NADPH and ATP. Cyclic flow, on the other hand, just uses photosystem one and this H plus ion pump to continually make these travel around here, and that will only make an H plus ion gradient, which therefore only makes ATP. Okay, this is important because the next process, which is the Calvin cycle, uses more ATP than it does NADPH, and therefore you're going to have to make different <coughs> amounts of ATP and NADPH. Okay. Uh, the Calvin cycle is going to take three carbon dioxides and it's going to add them to these three RUBPs over here and it's going to make a bunch, it's going to make three of these unstable six carbon chains that break down into three carbon chains. Okay, Of the ones uh, that get produced, we're going to make a bunch of uh, G3P by adding some uh, ATP to them and adding some NADPH to them. Uh, and uh, of the six NADPH that gets made from this process, only one of them is a product because the other five have to go to making more RUBP. We know that the G3P is half of a glucose, and so if you have two G3Ps, you can make one glucose molecule, and that means that it's gonna take a total of six carbon dioxides to make one glucose, which makes sense because that is the overall formula for photosynthesis. You take six carbon dioxides and make one glucose, right? Um, there is a problem that can happen with photosynthesis with the Calvin cycle specifically, where Rubisco picks up an oxygen atom instead of picking up or an oxygen molecule instead of picking up carbon dioxide. This is called photorespiration, and it's bad. And so there are special plants, CAM plants, and C4 plants um, that have uh, evolutionary adaptations in order to prevent photorespiration. So these plants are going to be prevalent in areas that are hot and dry because that's the time where you have to keep your stomata closed, and that's when the oxygen is going to build up. Okay, the idea behind cellular respiration is basically the opposite of photosynthesis. Okay, uh, if you have cellular respiration without oxygen, that's called anaerobic respiration, and you're going to take glucose and go through glycolysis, you're going to make two NADH and two ATP. The ATP are what you want, the NADH is useful, or useless rather, so the NADH gets sent back into a process that's called alcoholic fermentation or lactic acid fermentation, which then allows it to be turned back into NAD, which allows glycolysis to happen again. Okay. If you have aerobic respiration, though, you can continue on. The end of glycolysis produces pyruvate. Pyruvate goes into the prep steps, which makes two more NADH. The prep steps end in acetyl coenzyme A. Acetyl coenzyme A goes into the Krebs cycle, which produces more NADH and more FADH2. Uh, and then all that stuff goes into the electron transport chain to make uh, ATP. The ATP that's producing glycolysis in Krebs cycles produces something called substrate level phosphorylation, whereas the ATP produced in the electron transport chain is called oxidative phosphorylation or chemiosmosis. Okay? Uh, we know that it's not just sugar that can participate in cellular respiration, fats can too, so can proteins. Right? Uh, fats do it by breaking down these uh, fatty acid tails into two carbon chains that are called acetyl coenzyme A uh, in a process that's called beta oxidation, and so fats are really energy rich. Okay? Then we talked about the cell cycle. We said, I prefer monkeys at the circus. That's interphase, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, cytokinesis. And we know that um, the um, prefer monkeys at the circus part, or prefer monkeys at the part is um, mitosis and meiosis. And then interphase is the longest cell cycle. Interphase is G1, S, and G2. G1 phase is um, where the cell is going to going to grow because it just split. S phase is where it's going to duplicate its DNA. G2 is when it's going to grow in order to uh, get ready to split again. Okay. In mitosis, you don't really need to know much except for the fact that um, the chromosomes are only going to exist during mitosis, that every other time they're in chromatin form. And we know that metaphase is when they're going to line up on the metaphase plate and then they're going to get yanked apart. And then the difference between cytokinesis in an animal cell is that it forms a cleavage furrow and in a plant cell, it's going to form the cell plate. Then we moved on to unit three. Unit three was on uh, genetics, and we talked about the different types of reproduction. We said asexual reproduction was the better kind as far as efficiency and speed goes, but it's bad because it doesn't have any genetic ver diversity in, uh, included in it. Sexual reproduction is less uh, efficient, and it's uh, not as fast, but it results in uh, genetic variation, and genetic variation turns out to be very important. We said that the, in a sexual reproducing species, uh, we tend to have differences in the chromosome number, whereas prokaryotes are all N. Um, eukaryotes can be, or uh, organisms that sexually reproduce uh, can be like 2N or 3N or 4N or whatever, okay? <coughs> we talked about genetic variation being very important. 
<coughs> and the places where genetic variation comes into play is uh, the law of independent assortment during uh, meiosis and also crossing over during meiosis that happens during prophase one. Uh, so in crossing over, there is a physical crossing over the two chromosomes, the two homologous chromosomes, and they trade uh, genetic information between them. This is a simple crossing over. It could also happen where they cross over in like 10 spots. This is crossing over in just one spot, okay? Um, Life cycle is not really important. Changes in chromosome number uh, cause rapid evolution, and so a rapid speciation, rather. The examples that we gave of this, of this were um, when you have a, a non-disjunction occur that can cause uh, polyploidy, or if you can have two uh, chromosomes that actually fuse together, and then you'd have one less chromosome in the next generation than you'd have in the previous one, okay? Um, genetic stuff, we said we could use Punnett squares in order to determine the uh, um, percentages of offspring that are, that are likely to be expected. Um, and then there's all kinds of different interactions that can occur. So as far as dominance is concerned, we've got complete dominance. That means that the uh, homozygous dominant individual is going to have the exact same phenotype as the heterozygote. We said there's incomplete dominance where the homozygous dominant has a more extreme phenotype than the heterozygote does. And then there's codominance where both of the alleles actually get shown if uh, the organism is heterozygous. Um, we know there's multiple alleles, which means that there's uh, there are genes. That there's more than one, uh, or sorry, more than two options for alleles, right? So you could have like eye color or hair color, where if you had a hair color example, it would be brown, black, blonde, red. Those are all different alleles that you could have for that. It's not just two options, right? Um, Polygenic inheritance is when there's uh, many genes that affect a single phenotype. So we talked about um, human height here being affected by multiple different genes. Epistasis is the overriding of one gene. So we talked about the rats and how they could have two pigments, black or brown, but some of the rats turn up white because those pigments don't get attached to their hairs. Uh, so the attachment gene overrides the pigment gene, right? Uh, pliotropy was when one uh, specific gene affects many different phenotypic traits. So we talked about like uh, albinism here where they don't produce melanin and that causes them to have red eyes and pale skin and blonde hair, right? Uh, and then there's norm of reaction, which means that uh, even if two organisms have the exact same genetics, the nutrients that they get from their environment has a lot of effect on how they will turn out, okay? Sex linkage means it's on the X chromosome. Males only have one X chromosome, therefore we say they're hemizygous or they only have one copy of a trait, okay? Gene linkage is when two genes are on the same chromosome. If two genes are on the same chromosome, they will be inherited together more than 50% of the time, okay? Now, how often they get inherited together, if, as long as it's over 50%, is determined by how close together they are on the chromosome. So if they're right next to each other, they might get uh, inherited together 99% of the time. But if they are really far apart, they might be closer to only like 54% of the time or something like that, okay? The way that we spot linked genes uh, is by looking at the parents and the offspring. So if the offspring have the exact same phenotypic combinations as the parents, so let's say the parent has blonde hair, blue eyes, and one of the kid has blonde hair, blue eyes, and the other parent has brown hair, brown eyes, and the other kid has brown hair, brown eyes, right? They didn't get a combination of those two traits. They got only the traits that their parents had, and that means that there was probably gene linkage going on, right? Uh, DNA replication stuff. So the stuff you need to know about DNA replication, you need to know there's a leading strand and a lagging strand. So the leading strand is going to go towards the replication fork. That's the area where our, uh, our DNA helicase is opening up the, the, the uh, DNA double helix. And the lagging strand is moving in the opposite direction. The lagging strand is going to have to keep jumping back and therefore is producing a bunch of fragments. Those fragments are called Okasaki fragments and they will have to be joined together by DNA ligase. Uh, transcription, we already talked about a little bit, but we're going to go back and do it again here. There's this thing called a promoter. That's the area of the DNA that uh, the RNA polymerase attaches to. It then will sequence the mRNA of that gene, and that mRNA then becomes what's known as the primary mRNA transcript. That's this thing here. The primary mRNA transcript gets a G cap added. It gets a poly A tail added. The G cap is where the ribosome attaches. Poly A tail is what determines how long it lasts in the cytoplasm. Then we've got um, the alternate splicing going on here where we're splicing out uh, the introns so that there's only exons left. And then this is two different ways that you could splice them together. That's going to produce two different proteins from the same uh, DNA sequence. Translation. So translation is where you have um, 
mRNA being made into a protein, it happens using uh, anticodons on tRNA. So there's codons on the RNA and they'll match up with anticodons on the tRNA. And then ribosomes will um, bond those uh, polypeptides together into a polypeptide chain. And then that polypeptide chain gets uh, folded and then made into a protein. Okay, this was like the page that we did on the genetics big picture. We said that this one thing here could be an allele, right? And the allele actually represents a strand of DNA. And the strand of DNA is um, uh, uh, going to correspond to some promoter and then a gene. And the RNA polymerase attaches to it and makes mRNA. That mRNA gets modified and then gets made into a protein. And the protein is what actually causes that trait, which is why we talk about alleles. Okay. Um, chromosome structure, we talked about how folded up chromosomes get. Uh, it's basically like you wrap them up and then you wrap them up some more and then you do it some more and some more and some more. Uh, but you should know that these chromosomes only exist in their fully wrapped state in um, uh, mitosis. And then most of the time they're in this form where there's some, that are, there's some spots that are really um, condensed and there's a lot of spots that aren't really condensed. This is called euchromatin versus heterochromatin. Euchromatin is the part that's not super condensed. Heterochromatin is the part that is super condensed. Right, um, euchromatin gets expressed, heterochromatin does not. Um, the heterochromatin is caused by DNA methylation and histone acetylation, which basically causes the DNA to clump up on itself. Okay. Uh, prokaryotic gene regulation is a lot simpler. It uses these things called operons. Operons work by having a, a regulatory uh, or a, a, a operator region here that blocks the promoter so that RNA polymerase can't attach to it, so it can't transcribe that gene. Um, eukaryotic DNA is, or eukaryotic gene regulation is much more complicated, uses things like transcriptional controls, um, and also these things called transcription factors like enhancer regions, activators, and repressors. We talked about DNA technology uh, in that we use the polymerase chain reaction to make a whole bunch of different copies of um, DNA, and then we can cut them up using restriction enzymes, and then uh, put them into a DNA gel electrophoresis machine where we run electrical current through them. Since DNA is negatively charged, it moves towards the positive end, and that means that the smaller segments will move more towards the positive ends, and the larger segments won't go as far. Unit four was on evolution. So we said that there's a, a law of evolution that says species change over time and then many different theories of evolution. Lamarck's theory is mostly incorrect. He, Lamarck was the one that says that giraffes got their long necks by stretching out their necks a little bit each generation, right? Uh, and then they passed on that gene to the next generation. And that is not the case most of the time, but there's a little bit of uh, truth being lended to this through epigenetics. Epigenetics um, says that what your parents do in their lifetime can change their gene expression and some of that gene expression can get passed on to you. Um, Darwin's theory of descent with modification says that organisms that have genes that make, that give them traits that make them more likely to survive and reproduce will be more likely to pass on those traits to the next generation and therefore those genes will be more uh, likely to show up in uh, larger quantities in the next generation. Um, Microevolution versus macroevolution. Macroevolution is uh, the thing that says that uh, species are going to change over large periods of time. Microevolution is how they change from uh, generation to generation. We said that we can use Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium or Hardy-Weinberg equation to figure out the frequencies of alleles. Uh, and then um, we can say that an organism is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium as long as all these things are true. The purpose of these things is to prevent evolution from happening. It prevents selection and it also prevents genetic drift. There's two different types of, na of uh, natural selection, or three different types of natural selection, rather. There's stabilizing selection that's going to favor the intermediate phenotype. There's a, oops, there's directional selection that's going to favor um, the intermediate phenotype shifting towards one of the extremes slightly. And then um, there is a disruptive selection that's going to favor the extremes over the intermediate phenotype. Okay. Um, when we talked about uh, extended evolution here, we talked about all the different types of genetic drift, the bottleneck effect, the founder effect, um, and just general genetic drift and also gene flow, right? And then we talked about the weird stuff like heterozygote advantage versus um, uh, the dominant disorders, dominant, yeah, diseases, okay? Um, speciation. So biological species concept says for enable for in order for two organisms to be members of the same species, they have to be able to reproduce. And there's all kinds of reasons why they wouldn't reproduce. That's all these incompatibilities here and isolations, right? And they lead to the two types of speciation. The first type of speciation is called allopatric speciation, which means there's a physical barrier in between them called the geographic isolation, right? And then there's the sympatric speciation, which means uh, same country. So they're right next to each other, but they still don't reproduce together. And so that's caused by some other type of isolation, okay? 
Um, there's different types of evolution, two different types, divergent evolution and convergent evolution. Divergent evolution is the thing where you have a common ancestor and then the um, structures evolve in two different ways. That's going to lead to homologous structures and that is uh, different from uh, conversion evolution where you have two organisms that are not from a common ancestor that will converge on a common trait. So we said that thorns have evolved many times and flight has evolved many times. That's why the birds of uh, wings of a bird are uh, analogous to the wings of a butterfly because they both evolved flight at different times, not from common ancestry. Okay. Um, then we want to talk about history of life, really not important. Uh, factors that influence evolution, mass extinction events are really important because they open up ecological niches, right? And then continental drift was really important because that's how all the species sort of started out with one common ancestor and then got branched to all these different um, continents, okay? Um, viruses and stuff. So we talked about the fact that a virus is basically just a uh, genome that is encased into a uh, protein capsid, okay? And we said that um, viruses go into a couple different phases. There's the lytic cycle. The lytic cycle is where they are just going to make a whole bunch of viruses and then destroy the cell and release themselves. Lysogenic cycle is where they are going to uh, insert their DNA into the chromosome of the uh, host and then play the waiting game for a while while the host reproduces. And then the animal infections are a little bit different, although it's mostly a lysogenic cycle. Uh, they also have a little bit of viral shedding that takes place at the same time. Okay? Retroviruses, we said, are um, organisms that uh, have RNA is their genome, but they also contain this thing called reverse transcriptase, and reverse transcriptase allows them to make DNA from their RNA, but we said it's very error prone, and so that leads to a lot of mutations, and so uh, retroviruses tend to mutate rapidly. Okay, uh, Prokaryotes, we said there's two different types of prokaryotes, bacteria and archaea, and we said that um, bacteria can be gram positive or gram negative based on the content of their cell wall. Peptidoglycan content, uh, or high peptidoglycan content is going to lead to gram positive, gram negative is low peptidoglycan content. Okay? Um, we said that most bacteria are not pathogenic and they actually do all kinds of things that's really important, like they um, are good for our ecosystems and stuff like that. They do carbon fixation, nitrogen fixation, and they're largely uh, used for decomposition. Okay? Uh, we said there's things called uh, horizontal gene transfer that allows for bacteria to trade genes and, and express new DNA. And so um, general bacterial trans uh, transformation is where they take in DNA. Bacterial conjugation is where two bacteria meet up and they transfer DNA on a plasmid, right, through a cytoplasmic bridge. And then bacterial transduction is when a virus is going to uh, uh, transfer the DNA from its, one of its hosts to its next host um, by accident, okay? Uh, we said that bacteria can uh, represent all the different tif uh, different types of, nutri of nutrition. So photo meaning they're getting their energy from light, chemo meaning they're getting their energy from chemical, hetero meaning they are eating other things, and auto meaning they are um, uh, making things themselves. The oxygen requirements are obligate anaerobes, meaning they have they are poisoned by oxygen. Uh, facultative anaerobes that they could use oxygen or not, and then obligate aerobes that have to have oxygen. Okay. We talked about the, about the different types of symbiosis here, mutualism, both organisms are going to be benefiting from it, commensalism, one organism benefits and the other, other is neither helped nor harmed. We said that commensalism might not be a thing, it might just be based on us not really understanding the relationship well enough, and then parasitism where one organism is helped and the other one is harmed. <clears throat> fungi, we said, aren't really important, um, but you should know that fungi are classified based on the reproductive structures. The zygote fungi are the uh, ones that look like molds. Um, uh, the club fungi are the ones that look like mushrooms, and the sac fungi are the ones that look like um, puffballs. Okay. Then we talked about plants. We said that plants had uh, different land adaptations or adaptations to be able to, to be on land. They had a waxy cuticle to prevent water loss. They had pollen to be able to disperse their their uh, gametes. They have roots to be able to take in. Uh, water and nutrients. They've got stomata to be able to do gas exchange, and they have lignified tissue in order to be able to stand up strong. Okay, um, vascular tissue. Two types of vascular tissue: xylem and phloem. Xylem is the dead stuff that's going to form this nice little hollow uh, tube that acts like a straw, and then two forces move water up the xylem. There's transpiration pull. That's called pressure potential, and then there is um, root pressure, which is called solute potential, which is caused by the fact that there's a large amount of dissolved solutes in the roots than there are in the soil. Okay. Um, the xylem only moves water up, 
whereas the phloem can move water in both directions, water and nutrients in both directions, and it uh, is made up of living cells, and those living cells are going to use pressure-directed flow, which involves active transport to move things from a sugar source to a sugar sink. Okay. We know that plants are going to grow in two regions only. That's the cambiums and the meristems. So um, all plants have meristematic growth. Only uh, woody plants have uh, cambium growth, right? And so uh, meristems are on the tips of the shoots, the ap or the axillary buds, and the tips of the roots. And then there's two types of cambiums. There's the cork cambium and the vascular cambium. The vascular cambium produces secondary xylem and secondary phloem, and the cork cambium produces um, uh, cork, which is part of the bark. Okay. We said that the growth hormones that are most important are the auxins, uh, and auxin in high concentration is going to um, inhibit growth, and in low concentration it's going to uh, stimulate growth. Okay. The plant responses that we need to know about are things like um, the uh, thigmotropism, phototropism, gravitropism, right? And then also photoperiodism, right? And so basically most of these work by just controlling um, the amount of growth hormone that are present. So all the tropisms work by um, having uh, increased auxin concentration on the side that they want to move away from. So on the dark side, there's an increased auxin concentration, which causes increased elongation, which points it towards the light. Right? Same with gravitropism and thigmatropism. Um, plants produce secondary compounds in order to avoid being eaten uh, because most of the time they don't want to get eaten or sometimes they do if it's uh, in their fruits. So those are supposed to taste good. Animal stuff. So we said that all animals are all eukaryotic and uh, multicellular and they have no cell walls. And then the metazoans are, have um, nerve and muscle tissue or the eumetazoans have nerve and muscle tissue. Um, and we divide them up based on what their blastopore forms into. So that's this pore in the gastrula here. If this pore forms the mouth, that's called a protostome. If this pore, uh, this pore forms the anus, that's called a deuterostome. So here's the uh, animal kingdom divided into protostomes and deuterostomes. The deuterostomes are the chordates, which are the vertebrates like you and me, and then echinoderms like starfish, and then protostomes are everything else. Okay. We talked about the lymphatic system. We said it was really important for being like the TSA agents or the security checkpoints of the body, uh, and it's going to work along with the immune system. We are going to use uh, the immune system's non-specific immune response to keep out pathogens, but occasionally they get in. When they do get in, we have an inflammatory response that's going to deliver these white blood cells, specifically macrophages, to the area where uh, an infection is happening, and the macrophages are going to uh, be the initial line of defense that is a non-specific immune response. The specific immune response is going to be the humoral immune response or the cell-mediated immune response. Humoral immune response is if the um, infection is in the bodily fluid, uh, and the cell-mediated is if it's in a cell. The humoral immune response is going to use B cells, and it's going to make antibodies to fight infections. And the uh, cell-mediated immune response is going to make these things called effector T cells, which are sometimes called killer T cells. Okay. Um, active versus passive immunity. Active immunity is the normal type of immunity, like the um, humoral and uh, the cell-mediated immune response. Passive immunity is um, when you have like breastfeeding, where you're getting antibodies from some other source, or uh, that's called natural passive immunity, or uh, artificial passive immunity that is administered as a treatment for some disease. Okay. Um, we said that there are immune system problems like allergies and autoimmune disorders. That's basically when your body uh, is going to recognize yourself, that's an autoimmune disorder, as a disease, or recognize something that isn't uh, a disease-causing pathogen as a disease-causing pathogen, like dust. Okay? Um, so then we talked about neurons and how neurons work. We said that they have this uh, gated sodium ion channel, and that's how the action potential travels down the neuron. We said that as they get myelinated, there's less channels that open, but the same amount of sodium that flows through, which leads to an increase in the speed. Between neurons, you've got the synapse here, and the synapse is going to be either chemical or electrical, and it's going to cause uh, the axon terminal here to release a neurotransmitter that is then absorbed by the dendrites of the next neuron, which causes it to fire. You don't really need to know parts of the brain, but you do need to know the difference between white matter and gray matter. White matter looks white because it's highly myelinated. It's like the wiring of the, brain, of the uh, nervous system, and gray matter is the processing area, and it's not highly myelinated. It's got a lot of cell bodies in it. Okay? Uh, we talked about the endocrine system. It turns out, or it seems based on the questions that they've asked in the practice tests, that the posterior pituitary gland and the anti-diabetic hormone seem to be important things that they are focusing on. Right? You should also know that the pancreas and, it, and uh, insulin and glucagon are a very important uh, uh, thing to know. Okay? Uh, animal behaviors here, we've got uh, less complex behaviors like kinesis, that's change in rate based on a stimulus. Taxis is movement towards or away from a stimulus. And then you got more complex behaviors like reflexes, whereas reflexes are um, ingrained in the genetics. 
uh, or encoded in the genetics, conditioning and cognition are based on previous experiences. Okay? And then when the last thing we did was ecology, and we said that in ecology, populations are going to distribute themselves based on um, the nutrient supply, and that nutrient supply is going to lead to uh, a carrying capacity that they have. So here's the carrying capacity of this uh, organism, and it's uh, uh, represented on this graph called logistic growth. The logistic growth is an S-curve, and it's uh, the realistic type of growth that involves the carrying capacity. Uh, the carrying capacity, again, is the maximum number of organisms that a specific area can support. Okay? Um, that is based on these things called density-dependent factors. So space, food and water, buildup of toxic waste and disease are all going to cause the carrying capacity. Uh, and so as the population's density increases, these things have a greater effect on that population. There's also density independent factors that don't lead to the carrying capacity because it doesn't matter what the density is, uh, density independent factors will always have an equal um, impact on the population. We said human populations don't really have carrying capacities because we have all this like technology and stuff. We've got technology to make GMOs so we can produce more food. We've got technologies to fertilize crops so we can produce more food. We've got technologies to get rid of waste, so on and so forth. Okay. We talked about community ecology, which is all the interactions of the different organisms in an ecosystem. We said that the more uh, biodiversity is, the more robust a community is. And so things that increase biodiversity are things like keystone species, which are species that um, have a disproportionate um, effect on the biodiversity for the amount of biomass that they represent. We said that the dominant species is always the primary producer, the one that has the greatest biomass. And we said that uh, based on the second law of thermodynamics, every time you go up in the um, uh, biomass pyramid here, you only have 10% of the previous uh, trophic, trophic levels biomass. The idea behind this is uh, the primary producers have a net primary production, and then every other group has a uh, secondary production, which means the amount of energy that they uh, make or that they use to make more biomass. Chemical cycles that are important are water cycle and carbon cycle, and also nitrogen and phosphorus. Nitrogen and phosphorus is nitrogen fixation uh, for the nitrogen cycle, and then phosphorus cycle is the erosion off of rocks, and then um, uh, the addition of that into aquatic ecosystems. So aquatic ecosystems, uh, they're mostly going to be limited by phosphorus, and you should know the different zones here. Mostly the important zones are photic versus aphotic. Photic zones are where all of the light is coming in. Aphotic zone is where there's no light, so the photic zone has a lot of photosynthesizers, and the aphotic zone is um, mostly just chemoautotrophs and also organisms that are breaking down dead organisms or decomposers. Right? And the last thing we talked about was conservation biology, and we said that um, uh, conservation biology is important because ecosystems are more robust the greater the biodiversity. Right? And um, sometimes organisms do still go extinct, and they actually are going extinct at a very high rate now, and they're due to these uh, four things. That's habitat loss, right? over-hunting and over-exploitation, pollution, and invasive and exotic species. And that was AP Biology. What are you supposed to do with this? This is how you know what you don't know. Okay, So if you're listening to this and you're like, yeah, I got you. I know what you're talking about. You don't need to study that thing. But if you're listening to this and you don't understand it, go back, read your book, read your Cliff's Notes book, watch the videos. One trick that you can use on here is at the top of every uh, piece of notes or every notes that I went over, there's a date. If you want to search that date on my website, you can go to the actual lecture for that day and rewatch the lecture for that specific day if you'd like to do that. Okay? What's up, Logan?